Welcome to March Grand Rounds for the Department of Emergency Medicine. Thank you all for coming. Um, very pleased to have our speaker today, uh, Dave Harrison, who I've known for a long time. He is um, a fellowship trained emergency physician who has uh, taken an interest and is now the medical director for the VGH Hyperbaric Unit. And I remember many, many, many decades ago when I first came and started working at VGH, I was so proud of the the, the fact that that unit was there, it was such a, an interesting thing. It's changed dramatically. The science has changed. Dave's definitely involved in the science of what is effective in hyperbar for hyperbaric medicine. And um, so we thought it was appropriate that he give grand rounds and get us all updated on um, the clinical indications and, uh, and make sure that we can educate people across the province about the value and when they should be referring and, and what it can do, what hyperbaric oxygen therapy can do for, for certain cohorts of patients. So, David, thank you very much for agreeing to come on short notice, too. <laughs> but I'm very, very glad that you're here. Nice to see you. Thanks. So, as Jim said, this is going to be actually quite a clinically oriented presentation. It's a bit like what I would do if you were coming to do a rotation in the hyperbaric unit by way of orienting you. And really, it's going to emphasize what... Um, emergency physicians need to know about hyperbaric oxygen therapy in order to refer people appropriately. Um, and so we're just going to go over a, a really three main points. So we're going to talk a little bit about what hyperbaric oxygen therapy is and how it works, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on the details of that because that's a nice to know but not a need to know for you folks. <clears throat> we'll do a review and update of indications. Might talk a bit about contraindications because that also leads into logistics uh, because uh, Putting people in a hyperbaric chamber for between three hours and nine hours does pose some unique challenges that uh, does influence uh, who's an appropriate candidate. And uh, we'll talk about that a bit as well. So how many here know Bruce Campana? So th thanks to Bruce, we have some hyperbaric medicine slogans. We have uh, gut bubbles, no troubles, you bend them, we mend them. So typically, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is thought to be treating decompression sickness, and that's, in fact, where it started. But we have evolved to some extent beyond that. And so we're going to talk a little bit about decompression sickness and gas embolism, but we'll talk more about other indications that you might not be aware of, some of which are new, some of which are not new, and some of which are perhaps on the way out. And we'll review those things. So there's been a hyperbaric program at BGH since the mid-'60s. Uh, we have a new chamber that was installed in 2004. Uh, we have a two-bed resuscitation bay, a three-lock configuration. It's a large chamber. It's 27 feet long and 9 feet wide. And we're pressurized or certified to go to 235 feet of seawater, but our deepest dive is 165. So it's quite a robust structure. The chamber's pressurized with air, not oxygen. So we have four compressors altogether that do that. Patients are generally seated in the chamber. We can seat eight people in our main lock and six in our research lock, which is um, dedicated to research only. And we also have capability for two stretchers, a ventilator. We can run pumps. We can um, connect to pacemakers that are inside the chamber, although pacers can't go in the chamber. And we can do full monitoring of uh, various functions, although we can't do end tidal CO2 monitoring. That technology does not exist. Patients, uh, once the chamber is pressurized, breathe oxygen in what we call a hood, which is like a Jetson space bubble helmet. So the internal um, um, environment in that hood is 100% oxygen. Um, and uh, the exhaled gases leave through these hoses and are expired out through a, vent, through a uh, regulator outside the chamber. So the chamber environment always stays at less than ideally 21.5% oxygen. It can go as high as 23, but beyond that we abort the treatment because it becomes a fire risk. So there are 14 disorders that are currently approved by Health Canada as indications for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and about half of those apply to emergency medicine practice. You probably weren't aware of that, but about half of the things that we treat, you actually should know about. And those are the 14 things that MSP in British Columbia will pay for. Uh, those diagnoses include air or gas embolism, carbon monoxide poisoning, uh, gas gangrene. Uh, there's a large group called acute traumatic peripheral ischemia, crush injury, compartment syndrome, uh, decompression sickness, and then there's another category called arterial insufficiencies, which include two things you should know about. One is central retinal artery occlusion, and the other is diabetic foot ulcers. Uh, we also can treat exceptional blood loss anemia, so a person who either 
cannot or will not be transfused, but has critical anemia causing uh, systemic uh, hypoxia and acidosis and organ failure, can be treated with HBOT. Intracranial abscess, uh, necrotizing soft tissue infections, so neck fash. Uh, refractory osteomyelitis, not responding to other medical or surgical therapy. Uh, delayed radiation injury of soft tissues and bone. This has really been the mainstay of our treatment for many years. So these are people who've had cancer, have had radiotherapy, but have had collateral damage from the radiotherapy and most commonly have either soft tissue radiant necrosis involving um, uh, mostly bladder and uh, to some extent uh, uh, rectum, or have uh, osteoradiant necrosis involving mandible mostly from squamous carcinoma of the uh, tongue and, and palate. Uh, compromise flaps and grafts, thermal burns, we've never treated one at VGH, and then the new kid in the block that we'll talk about quite a bit is uh, uh, sudden sensorineural hearing loss. Now, there are also a variety of off-label conditions, I won't call them indications, that are treated with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And these are treated in Vancouver. There are a number of private chambers in Vancouver. And if you walk into one of the private chambers with a complaint, any affliction known to man, they will offer to treat you and guarantee that they can make you better. So the list goes on and on. But really, a general grumpiness, marital discord, um, hair loss, doesn't work for hair loss. Uh, they'll, they'll treat you. So we have an active program. We have uh, an electric program that runs five days a week. We do two treatments a day, and we treat usually eight people per treatment as the goal. So we're treating, uh, giving 16 treatments a day on average. People have between usually 20 and 40, and occasionally as many as 60 treatments. So they're coming on a daily basis. And then we also have an active emergency program, and we do about 150 emergency treatments per year. <clears throat> so I was an emergency physician trained um, at VGH and have been practicing VGH for almost for 30 years now, I guess. Uh, and transitioning from hyperbaric to hyperbaric medicine from emergency medicine was interesting because in emergency medicine you treat everything and now I treat 14 conditions with one drug. The neat thing is you get to learn lots of new lingo, vocabulary, and there's a diving sort of um, tradition. I'm a diver originally. So we call the chamber the chamber. We call a treatment a dive. We call spinal DCS a spinal hit. Um, musculoskeletal we call the bends. There's the chokes the staggers and the pops. And we actually use this terminology because we're dealing with divers. And if you're dealing with a diver and saying, you know what, you can never go dive in again, unless you have credibility with that diver, they will not accept your advice. So the first thing you say when you encounter a diver at a merge, well, how was the viz today? And you'll learn all this stuff. Now, so does anybody know, it's important to have terminology, does anybody know what it's called when a diver gets a spinal hit, the bends, the chokes, staggers, and the pops all at once? No? Uh, it's called the shits, but it's spelled S-C-H-I-T-S, so it's it's not really a swear word. So we dose uh, oxygen with time and with pressure. And we dose in terms of atmospheres of feet of seawater. So one atmosphere is where we're all now. And if you add atmospheres, you don't have ATA. So our usual dive is 2.4 atmospheres or 45 feet of seawater equivalent. And that's what it looks like. So the patient's pressurizing the chamber to 45 feet of seawater on air. They then breathe oxygen. They have a five minute break so they don't seize because oxygen will cause CNS toxicity and seizures at this concentration. And they have a very variable number of these oxygen breathing periods. And that's our standard elective dive. For decompression sickness, we have more aggressive dives. This goes to 165. So at this depth, the patient is breathing oxygen. And this is the deepest that you can safely breathe oxygen 100% because beyond this, you're guaranteed of seizures. Um, even at this depth, people do seize. Uh, the tenders are breathing chamber air, and there are air breaks here. And this dive, this treatment can be as short as five and a half hours, but we can extend this. So a badly bent diver may be in the chamber for eight or nine hours before they get out. The US table 6A is our deep dive. This is for gas embolism. Occasionally, we'd use it for severe DCS. Uh, they go to 165. So the previous chamber dive was to 60 feet. This is 165. At this depth, the patient's on heliox because you can't breathe oxygen at this depth. Uh, so the patient's on heliox. <clears throat> the uh, tenders are quite badly impaired. <clears throat> Excuse me, at this depth, they have about the equivalent of having had three martinis at this depth because they have uh, narcosis. So in the chamber, the inside tenders don't make any clinical decisions. It's all by outside control uh, because you have to assume that your tenders in the chamber are impaired. And this can be also a very long dive, eight to nine hours with extensions. So... We're dosing with oxygen and time and pressure. So if we go to, for example, 165, that's six atmospheres. So the volume of a bubble is one-sixth what it would be at surface, according to Boyle's law. 
The diameter is one half of what it would be. So there's a relationship between volume and diameter that doesn't quite match. So a bubble's only half the size that it is uh, at depth as compared to surface. So you have compression of bubbles, which is important. You also have compression of other body cavities, which can be a problem all the way down and all the way up. So for example, your, your station tube connects your middle ear to your nasopharynx, and then your external auditory tube is subjected to pressure. If there's a pressure differential across this, you get what's called an ear squeeze. So our patients have to be able to equalize their ears. If they can't equalize their ears, they need a meringotomy. So our patients must be cooperative or unconscious or have a meringotomy. And those are some of the challenges we face when we have uncooperative patients. <clears throat> if you have an ear squeeze and it goes untreated, this is a person with no ear squeeze. This is a moderate ear squeeze and it's a severe ear squeeze. It's also an easy intubation, difficult intubation, and really, really tough intubation. So compartments get squeezed on the way down and they expand on the way up. And again, you can have problems though. People with active upper air, airway disease, chronic sinusitis may get down in the chamber, they can pressurize on the way up if their sinus won't equalize and the sinuses can actually rupture. And you can actually have intracranial rupture of mastoid or sphenoid sinuses into the brain, which is a bad thing when you're coming up in the hyperbaric chamber. So again, patients have to be cooperative or have meringotomies. So pressure plus time equals dissolved gas. There's good and there's bad. The good part about dissolved gas is that you have hyperoxygenation. We'll talk about how that works in a minute. The bad thing about that is decompression sickness, which occurs in divers and also can occur in our inside tenders. The first uh, patient emergency case that we treated in our chamber when we opened in 2004, the new chamber, was an inside tender from a local private chamber who had decompression sickness and she got out of work because they didn't know what they were doing. So it can happen in tenders. Now, does anybody know why divers prefer Guinness? Guinness has this really nice, foamy, creamy head on it. And the reason it has that is because Guinness is not carbonated, it's nitrogenated. And so when you go diving, you become a carbonated or a nitrogenated beverage. And if you uncork a bottle of Guinness too fast, it foams a lot. The same thing happens with diving. So that's an important thing to remember when you're taking history from a diver. We'll talk about that in a few minutes about what gets people bent. So what do you do? What happens physiologically when you combine this pressure, this oxygen, and dissolved oxygen in blood? What does that do? Well, there was a study done called Life Without Blood in 1960. This was a, a cardiologist who exsanguinated a number of pygmy swine in a hyperbaric chamber and exchange transfuse them with Bringer's lactate. Put them in the chamber at depth, and they lived with no hemoglobin. Because at 3 HEA, enough hemoglobin is dissolved in the serum, independent of the hemoglobin, or rather enough oxygen, sorry, is dissolved in the serum to meet your basal metabolic rate. So what we do with hyperbaric oxygen is we're dissolving oxygen in serum so that we have very high tissue levels of oxygen independent of hemoglobin. Um, interesting opportunity here. I, I would imagine that if it works for Pygmy swine that works for lawyers be a great study. We'll maybe look into that later. But if you're at 3 HTA on pure oxygen, your PO2 is greater than 2,000. So when you do a blood gas in the chamber, it just comes back as high, 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 because the machines only read to 800. What that does is it means that you're ordinarily, we're sitting here with a capillary PO2 of 50. In a hyperbaric chamber, your capillary PO2 is more like 250 to 500. So oxygen can dissolve farther away from a source of, uh, from a vascular bed, from a capillary. Ordinarily, O2 dissolves about 64 microns in our bodies at our normal tissue tensions. In a hyperbaric chamber, it'll dissolve as far as 250 microns. So it allows us to have oxygen penetrate into tissues that are ischemic because of a variety of reasons, whether it be edema, lack of blood flow, or compromise of the vascular bed, such as radiant necrosis, which is damaged capillary vessels, or diabetic foot ulcers. It also causes vasoconstriction, reduced edema, it decreases platelet adhesion, it increases red blood cell deformability, and it, all of this combines to provide streaming of oxygen-laden blood through areas of relative stasis and ischemia. And these are all um, mechanisms by which hyperbaric oxygen works for various conditions. It also enhances phagocytic killing of white cells. It has a direct uh, toxic effect on anaerobic and aerobic organisms and it inhibits alpha toxin production and clostridium necrosis. Within 20 minutes, the, the organism stops producing alpha toxin. And it also inhibits the reperfusion injury that occurs in the context of transient ischemia and reperfusion. So for example, in myocardial infarction or in stroke, there may be a role acutely 
for HBOT to mitigate that by virtue of decreasing white cell and endothelial adhesion. And finally, it displaces hemoglobin from, from mitochondria, or rather it displaces carbon monoxide. So people think that HBO works for carbon monoxide poisoning because it, it displaces carbon monoxide from hemoglobin. The important thing is that it displaces carbon monoxide from mitochondria and from the cell. You can exchange transfuse a dog with blood that has 30% carboxyhemoglobin, and the dog doesn't get sick, it gets anemic, because that carbon monoxide is all bound to hemoglobin. But if you give a dog enough carbon monoxide to breathe to induce a 30 or 40% hemoglobinemia with carbon monoxide, the dog will die. So it isn't the actual, it's not the displacement of oxygen from hemoglobin that causes carbon monoxide poisoning. It's the displacement of oxygen at the cellular level at the mitochondria that's important. And HBO induces angiogenesis in irradiated tissues in diabetic and diabetic wounds by virtue of changing oxygen gradients at the, sub, at the, at the tissue level. But we're not going to talk about that in great detail. The new kid in the block is stem cell mobilization. With a single treatment of hyperbaric oxygen, one doubles your peripheral stem cell uh, counts. And with a series of 10 or 20 treatments, the stem cell counts go up as much as eight times. So we don't really know if, if it may be actually stem cell mobilization that has a major role in treating these various conditions. But in the end, what you end up with is a diabetic foot uh, with HBO, and then you could have a diabetic foot that stays attached to the person's leg. And that's sort of the, the usual thing that people think about with HBOT on the elective side. So let's talk now about some of the new indications, because this is really why I'm here, is to fill you in on some new things that are happening. At certain times in our chamber, right now, over half of our patients have hearing loss. And the newest indication for HPOT is acute, idiopathic, sudden sensorineural hearing loss. It's been approved in the past two years. So this is a person who presents to the emergency department and says, you know, I woke up this morning, I cannot hear it on my right ear. It feels kind of plugged, some pressure there. You look in there, you see nothing. It looks perfectly normal. And they may have moderate to severe or profound deafness in that ear. No other findings whatsoever. There may, may or may not have been a recent uh, viral infection. Most often there isn't. And the important thing is that this is an acute event. By definition, it evolves over three days. Mostly people will say, you know what, I was sitting watching TV and all of a sudden I couldn't hear it in my right ear. Or I woke up in the morning and I couldn't hear. There may be tinnitus, there may be vertigo. It's a non-conductive hearing loss, and by definition, it must be 30 decibels at three frequencies. You're not going to know that when you see the patient because you haven't done an audiogram yet, but this is the definition. The important thing is that there's no history of pre-existing hearing loss. So this is not a person who has many years and says, gee, I'm, I'm worse today. It's not a person who says, I've been having progressive hearing loss for three years, and today I can't hear at all. And it's usually unilateral. It can be bilateral, but that's very rare. Um... So, this is not hearing loss associated with age. Uh, this is not the rapidly progressive where it happens over two to three years, which is associated with collagen vascular disorders. And it's not fluctuating. They say, my hearing's been fine. All of a sudden, I can't hear. And it's not associated with things like sepsis or antibiotic use or a variety of other things that cause hearing loss. So... This has been just recently approved for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but there are some problems with it. Um, and that is that we need to treat it fairly acutely, which is a fairly big stress on our program, which is why we're very careful about who we accept for hyperbaric oxygen therapy for hearing loss. The expected result of hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that we do have significant improvement in hearing. Uh, most recent Cochrane review demonstrated that mean improvement of 61% compared to 24% with control. So if you get HBO, you get a fairly significant improvement in your hearing compared to a control group. And gains can be from 20 to 37 or 40 decibels, which is a pretty significant improvement because if, you're, if your audiogram shows that you're down here with moderately severe hearing loss, you are hearing aid dependent. And that's a big problem. It's expensive and it's not very convenient. And if we can add 30 decibels to somebody who's kind of down in this area here, if you add 30 decibels or 40 decibels, you're coming up into mild hearing loss or normal hearing. So it's a pretty significant improvement in these people, which um, can be a matter of convenience. It can also be uh, very important for people like police officers and musicians who rely on their hearing to be able to work. A police officer who loses hearing in one ear can't go out on the street anymore because he has to be able to localize sound. He 
and you can't localize sound with one ear. So what, what do you do when you get these people that emerge? They come in, I can't hear, my ear feels full, I have some tinnitus. Um, otherwise, I'm totally well. You look in there, they're normal. Neurologically, they're normal. Uh, well, you make a provisional diagnosis. You say, I think you have sentinel hearing loss. It is a clinical diagnosis. It's backed up with an audiogram. So you need to treat them appropriately. We recommend that you start prednisone in the ED. You don't need to have an audiogram to start the prednisone. Prednisone is the first line treatment in a dose of 50 or 60 milligrams a day. And it can be for seven days, 10 days, 14 days. Some people treat for three weeks. But get them started with a week supply of prednisone. We can always stop it, or ENT can. They need to be referred to ENT. And we need to treat these people ideally within two weeks of the onset of the disease, and, and even better, we like to treat them within a day or two. So if we're referred to these people, uh, we'll see them that day or the next day, and we'll treat them that day or the next day and start them. Now, our, in context, our regular waiting list for elective therapy is three to four months, often. So we consider this to be a fairly urgent case. We're not going to come in with a team of five people at 2 o'clock in the morning to treat it, so don't refer at 2 o'clock in the morning. But the next morning, if we refer these people, we'll see them that day or the next day and start them immediately. But they need to see ENT as well. Uh, we need to have an audiogram arranged. You probably can't do that. We can. And uh, so you should be consulting HBU. They need to have an MRI to look for acoustic neuroma. That's rare. We've treated about 140 people now with hyperbaric oxygen for hearing loss in the last couple of years. We've only had one acoustic neuroma, and of course, it wasn't a physician. <clears throat> the second new kid on the block is central retinal artery occlusion, for which there is no effective therapy other than hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And the evidence for that is mostly anecdotal in case reports. There are no randomized clinical trials. This results from embolization of the central retinal artery or its branches, which supplies the inner retina and the macula. So these people have profound visual loss, you know about this condition. Um, about 10% of people also have ciliary retinal artery uh, vascular supply, so it's a bit like the heart. Some people have a collateral circulation. The problem with retinal artery occlusion is that within a few days, the arteries will recannulize. They'll have a normal perfusion, but the problem is that the retina dives in about 6 to 12 hours. So by the time flow is restored, they're blind in that eye. And the nice thing with hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that by giving hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we can provide enough diffusion from adjacent tissues, adjacent, adjacent eye layers, to keep the retina alive for the three or four days or five days or six days until it recanalizes, and that way vision is preserved. And the other therapies, carbogen, paracentesis, they don't work. So, as I said, there are numerous cases of effective therapy for this. There are no randomized clinical trials. But this is a condition that we do consider an emergency. If you encounter someone who walks into the emergency department at 2 o'clock in the morning or 3 in the afternoon or any time and says, I can't see it in my right eye, and you make the diagnosis, we will come in with a team of five and treat that patient right then and there. So those patients should all be referred. Now, obviously, if you're in a, in a uh, farther away, and there's transport required, that severely limits our capability. Because the reality is it's very difficult to get anybody into the chamber within six hours who's not in Vancouver or perhaps Victoria. You might, you might manage it in Kelowna, um, but it's a stretch because it's hard to organize air back that quickly. But you treat them the way you would ordinarily treat them, do all the things you learn to do for artery occlusion, but then consult ophthalmology and consult HBO. And the time to do that is when they come into the department when you look in the eye, make the diagnosis. We want to get them in the chamber within 12 hours, ideally. OK, here's the other thing you, you may have seen, you probably have never thought of calling the hyperbaric auction uh, for. And this is cases of gas embolism resulting from penetrating chest trauma. We've treated two cases now of, of gas embolism from penetrating chest trauma, both of them iatrogenic from the CT suite during needle biopsy of the lung. So the spontaneously breathing patients having a needle biopsy of the lung who have a sudden loss of consciousness, they may get transient ST elevation on their ECG. They may seize. They may or may not have a cardiac arrest. The diagnosis in that situation is gas embolism until proven otherwise. 
So this would also apply to the person you're seeing in the emergency department who perhaps is having a paracentesis. It might apply to someone who's having a chest tube insertion. And it would apply to any patient with chest or neck trauma who's intubated and who has a sudden event on the first squeeze of the bag. Because what you have is a communication between the airway and the vascular bed. And as soon as you put them on positive pressure ventilation, you do your RSI, you put the tube in, you squeeze the bag, you're not going to see a seizure because they're paralyzed, but they have a cardiac arrest. That's a bad sign. If you've intubated someone and they haven't had an RSI and they're not paralyzed, they will usually seize. That is a gas embolism. Okay. And those patients, the problem here is it's a clinical diagnosis and a CT scan, in all probability, will not show air in the heart, will not show air in the brain. So it's a clinical diagnosis. The treatment of this is to isolate the lung, which is the problem, if this is a chest trauma, which means intubating the opposite lung and getting them, and getting them in, in stabilized and then into a hyperbaric chamber. Because hyperbaric oxygen therapy for gas embolism is highly effective. People can look profoundly injured and do very well. The most dramatic case we had was a 74-year-old man in Victoria who is having a ventriculogram as part of his coronary artery workup. And the uh, cardiology uh, attending inadvertently injected his left ventricle with 37 cc's of air. He thought it was contrast. The patient had an immediate seizure, a VF arrest, was defibrillated, went for CT of his head, normal CT, no gas. Arrived at VGH four hours later with some brainstem reflexes only, had hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and five days later walked out of hospital. Without HBO, that person was going to be dead. So it's a very dramatic thing, which responds extremely well to hyperbaric oxygen. And even, even at 8, 12, 24 hours, patients tend to do quite well with HBOT if you are treating um, arterial gas embolism. You can get this from trauma. You can get it from a central line. So you can get it when you're trying to put in a central line. You can get it from also air going into a venous line. A venous gas embolism will usually present with dyspnea, dropping sats, chest pain, and maybe some arrhythmias, and that's right-sided heart strain. The pulmonary filter is pretty good at filtering out air, so they don't usually get a gas embolism. Those patients, we don't treat. Because the support of therapy, usually within 30 or 40 minutes, they'll resolve. The problem is that a certain subset of the population either has a PFO, and in this room, probably six or seven of you have a PFO. Uh, it's about 25% of the population have a PFO. Ordinarily, it's closed, but if you load up the right side of the heart with gas, now you've got a right-to-left shunt happening because of right-sided pressures, and you can embolize across that PFO and have an arterial embolism that's going to go to the brain. There's also a certain part of the population that doesn't have a PFO but has a right-to-left shunt in the lung. So in the absence of a PFO, with a large gas load on the right side, they will embolize and manifest neurological symptoms. So anyone who presents with a neurological symptom in the context of a procedure or event that could cause a venous gas embolism should be considered for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. That's probably an arterial embolization. But you won't see it on CT scan. You won't see it on MRI. The pickup on CT scan is less than 50%. Okay. But clinical diagnosis, but keep it in mind because the patients do very badly if they aren't treated and do very well if they are. Let's talk a bit about decompression sickness. Let me just check for time here. Okay. Yeah, we'll leave quite a bit at the end because usually there are quite a few. So decompression sickness is really what hyperbaric oxygen was first used to treat Kazon disease. And we still treat... 15 to 20 cases per year in British Columbia. We don't treat all the cases we probably should because cases are missed. We are aware of people who present to the emergency department complaining of vague neurological symptoms 
and are sent home without a diagnosis being made. The ones that are missed tend to be inner ear DCS because it's an atypical presentation. So it's again someone who presents the day after diving or the day of diving with predominantly vertigo. And it can be quite dramatic. And unless, uh, and the person may or may not volunteer that they've been diving. I think I probably had inner ear DCS uh, at one point in my life. I went diving the next day, I had profound vertigo, it lasted about 48 hours and resolved spontaneously. I was lucky. But I think that was probably inner ear DCS. But that's how they present profound vertigo, severe nausea in most cases. There may or may not be hearing loss, there may or may not be tinnitus. Mostly it's, it's hearing, it's, it's vertigo. So when you see that, you need to ask the question, is this in your ear DCS? So there are no randomized clinical trials, uh, but it's still standard of care. There's no question that most of these people should be treated. Symptoms can vary though. And if you see someone with a painful joint after diving, the question is, is this DCS or a strained shoulder? So you need to take a careful history about the nature of their pain, when it started, any other injuries that might have happened. And do they actually have a dive profile that would be consistent with decompression sickness. What you need to bear in mind is the vast majority of patients who have decompression sickness are not in violation of their computer in terms of no decompression limits. 85 to 90% of people who we treat for decompression sickness will say, I was fine. My computer said I didn't owe any deco. Or my buddy's computer said I didn't owe any deco. Almost no one dives on tables anymore. They're all on computers. And most of them did not violate the computer. What they did violate is their ascent rate sometimes. But the question to ask is, how close were you to your no decompression limits? And they go, oh, well, you know, I had three minutes left. I was, I was a deep dive. I was there a long time. Because history of gas loading is necessary. A history of violating the computer is not. On the other end of the spectrum, if people say, I was, I was diving for 20 minutes, at 20 feet, and they come up and they have a sore joint or a numb hand or some other complaint. That is not decompression sickness. You can't get decompression sickness from 20 feet of water. It's physiologically impossible. You need to be deeper than 30, 33 feet minimum for a long time to get decompression sickness. So at 33 feet, the no, the no decompression limits are like two hours. You can be there for almost forever. Very difficult to get bent at 33 feet. At 20 feet, you can't get bent. You can get a gas embolism, but you can't get bent. So it's very important when you're seeing a patient who you think might have DCS to actually take a history of the dive. Because when you call me, I'm going to ask you to go back and take it if you haven't done it already. Because we need to know what the gas load is. You need to know how long they were down, the depth they were at, and roughly how long they were at each depth. We need to know if there was a rapid ascent. Somebody who is at 20 feet, doesn't have DCS, and they present with a sore shoulder, we don't need to hear about that. But you can get gas embolism in a pool. The first case of, of gas embolism I ever saw was actually as an emergency resident uh, in Ontario where I did my CCFPEM. And it was a dive instructor who drank a bottle of wine and then taught a class. Was doing doff and don at the bottom of the pool, so they put their gear on and take it off at the bottom of the pool. We don't do that anymore, but in those days that was happening. And this person did a breath held ascent from eight feet, bottom of the pool. Got to the surface, swam a few feet, seized and was unconscious. Had a gas embolism from eight feet of, eight feet of pool water. You can get a gas embolism from six feet. So if you breathe compressed air at 8 feet, or say 10 feet, and if you ascend in the water column without exhaling, the volume of gas in your lungs is going to expand enough that it can cause pulmonary barrel trauma and cause either tension pneumothorax or if it crosses into the vascular bed, a gas embolism. So, person presents to the pool during a during a, a, a class on scuba diving with neurological symptoms, consistent with a stroke, usually seizure, loss of consciousness, often a regaining of consciousness, and then focal neurologic signs. That person 
has a gas embolism to prune otherwise. And those people should be treated. Now, it's rare, and you don't see scuba divers presenting with gas embolism from open water dives because those people die. They never get to us. They have their seizure, they lose consciousness, and they drown. But a person in the pool who has that presentation, you need to be thinking, okay, is this, is this a gas embolism? The other thing to be aware of is we've treated a number of people now who presented with decompression sickness at 24 to 48 hours after their dive. So the vast majority of cases who present with DCS present within six to eight hours, or at least they have onset of symptoms within six to eight hours. Most of them get their symptoms, then they go home, and they drink some beer and have a pizza, and then if they're a technical diver, they'll breathe all of their oxygen from all their various bottles, and then they'll call their buddy, and their buddy says, you better go to Emerge, and they show up at Emerge at about 11 o'clock at, at night, and they get referred about one or two in the morning, and then we treat them. That's a typical pattern, okay? But most people have their onset of symptoms within a couple of hours. The problem is that a, a subset of the population will actually have the onset of symptoms at 12, 24, 36, even 48 hours. And those people predominantly are air travelers. So although theoretically, you shouldn't have any bubbles in your system after 18 to 24 hours, because at that point you're considered clean according to the diving uh, propaganda. In fact, that's not the case. You still have small bubbles in your system, at least some people do, at 24 to 36 hours. And if you fly on, an un on a pressurized aircraft, that aircraft is pressurized to between 8 and 12,000 feet of seawater. Oh, sorry, 8 or 12,000 feet elevation. If you have small bubbles in your system, or if you're super saturated and don't have bubbles, and you go to that elevation, what you've done now is you've uncorked your carbonated beverage at altitude. You decrease the ambient pressure around your blood and you will bubble more. So people will present with decompression sickness on the aircraft 24 to 36 hours after their dive, where theoretically they should not be having decompression sickness. The same thing can happen when a person goes to elevation because they either live there or they have to drive over the Malad Highway to get from Tofino to Vancouver or Victoria. So they, they typically have done a fairly aggressive dive. They're gas-loaded. They're asymptomatic. They're a carbonated beverage. And they uncork the, the bottle at elevation. And they typically will present with CNS symptoms. They may present with inner ear DCS, in my experience. It may be joint pain, but they very often will present with, with CNS symptoms. And I've seen a couple of people whose CT scan looked like Swiss cheese because they dove in Tofino and they drove to Vancouver. And at elevation, at the 24-hour mark after they dive, they got their DCS hit. So if you see someone and they've been, and they're presenting with unusual symptoms in eMERGE and they've been traveling and diving in their destination, that's where you need to be thinking about, is this decompression sickness? Because it can occur late. It typically occurs in a person who's had three or four sequential flights. Because every time they go up in elevation, the bubble gets bigger, it coats a protein, and they come back down, the bubble stays larger, though, because the hysteresis in the bubble. Second flight, it gets even bigger. So it's usually the second or third flight because they're flying from some little island to a bigger place, Florida, and then they fly to Chicago and Vancouver. With each flight, the bubble gets bigger, and they usually present on the second or third flight. They may also present when they get to Kelowna or Kamloops because they're diving at sea level, and then they go to elevation over the, over the coke, or they're living at elevation. Or it could be someone who lives in the North Shore and is living at elevations of over 500 or 1,000 feet. So these are the little pitfalls that you need to be aware of in diagnosing DCS. That The problem is that patients haven't read the textbooks, and it can be a very atypical presentation. The pain of DCS can be transient. It can be throbbing. It can be sharp. It can be dull. It can be quite quite varied. The vast majority of people who have a painful DCS hit, if you look closely enough, will have neurological symptoms. The vast majority will actually have a sensory change of some kind, some numbness and tingling. Most won't have weakness, but many do. Okay. So I would say that of all the people who treat with DCS, maybe 20% are type 1 with pure joint hit. 
and the vast majority, if we look, have neurological symptoms. The other thing you might see and emerge is chronic refractory osteomyelitis. And you can be an important person in this person's care because they may have been managed by their GP or infectious disease or a variety of people for six months for their chronic osteomyelitis, and nothing is making them better. And they come into eMERGE desperate, saying, you know what, they want to take my foot off. I've got chronic osteomyelitis, nothing is working, or they flared up an infection. And if you're aware that hyperbaric oxygen is an, is an effective therapy for chronic osteomyelitis, you can make that referral. And that can happen in Vancouver, Kelowna, anywhere. We treat people from all over the province. So typically, it's the person who's having medical therapy and surgical therapy, and they have not gotten better after a number of months of treatment. Hyperbaric oxygen, when added to those other modalities, can result in cure where nothing else did. It occurs in people with diabetic foot ulcers. It occurs in people after dental extraction. We've had a number of usually young, healthy people in their teens or their 20s who get a dental extraction, molar, you know, wisdom teeth extraction and end up with chronic osteomyelitis of their mandible. It's a terrible disease, very difficult to treat, painful, and disfiguring because the mandible deforms as this disease progresses. And it tends to not respond well to surgical debridement or antibiotics. But if you add hyperbaric oxygen therapy to those other two therapies, the cure rate is much better. Uh, it can also be post-traumatic, so it could be a, someone who six months ago had their tib-tib fracture and now they're coming in and they say, you know what, I need some antibiotics because this is flared up again, nothing else is working. That's the person that you can refer for hyperbaric oxygen therapy. But the important thing is that this needs to go along with appropriate surgical and medical management, but that's my problem, not yours. The problem is that these people get abandoned to hyperbaric oxygen therapy. People say, well, let's, you know, nothing else has worked. We'll just stop all that and see if you know, some oxygen can help. And the problem with hyperbaric oxygen therapy is that we're viewed in, in two schools. Some people think that we're crazy charlatans who treat everything, but really accomplish nothing. And some people think we can treat everything and, and that oxygen is good, so more oxygen is better, and therefore we have the cure for all afflictions known to man. The fact is we're neither. We have 14 or 15 diagnoses in one drug, which in the right situation can be quite effective but it needs to be used appropriately with other therapies. The other person who you will see and may not recognize is the person with radiation cystitis. This is the third newest indication for HBOT. And these are the people who present uh, with their either urinary retention, clot retention, with hematuria, after they've had prostate surgery six months or a year or two years or 10 years before, and they'll give a history of recurrent episodes of what sounds like a UTI with hematuria. They'll describe irritated avoiding uh, symptoms, frequency, urgency, maybe dysuria, episodes of hematuria, which may be painless. They may or may not have an infection. And typically it starts out with mild events and then gets worse, but they can't present with the first episode with gross hematuria clot retention. These are people that have radiation cystitis usually occurring from either external beam radiotherapy, occasionally brachytherapy of the prostate, or cervix. And the problem is that radiotherapy is very effective for killing cancer cells, but it causes collateral damage. So these people, if you do a cystoscopy, have a very angry-looking mucosa in the bladder with friable vessels, telangiectasias, and they bleed. This is a chronically progressive disorder with no effective therapy. It gets worse over the course of many years, and the conventional treatments are to use a variety of agents to essentially sclerose the vessels in the bladder, none of which reverse or really have an effective uh, means of decreasing the, the, the process. So they, fulgur they do fulguration, they do insulation of a variety of noxious substances in the bladder, and in the end, one ends up with a chronically scarred nugget of a bladder without any ability to retain urine, Eventually, they take that out, and they end up with ileal loop. So it's not a good disease to have. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy used in the right population and used early has a 95% cure rate for this condition. 95% cure rate. So if they get hyperbaric oxygen therapy, 
ideally within six months of onset, and ideally in a person who's under 65, but we treat older people too. The vast majority, after 40 to 60 treatments, their hematuria resolves, and on cystoscopy, their bladder looks almost normal. And this is a sustaining effect. About 10 to 20% of people who we treat have to come back for follow-up treatment in the six months to two years, but the vast majority do very well. Their infections stop, their irritated avoiding symptoms stop, their hematuria stops, and they go from being severely debilitated by this condition, because it feels like they have a urinary, urinary tract all the time, to being fine. Again, many of the physicians in the community don't know about hyperbaric oxygen for this indication, but you're going to see them because they're going to come into the emergency department with these complaints. Question? What if it's longer, more than six months? We'll still treat them. They still do well. Four or they, five years? Yep. yep. We don't set any limit on how, how late it, the presentation is. We'll treat them all. Uh, it's a big time commitment. It's usually 65 treatments. But this is a, a condition which has tremendous morbidity Significant mortality. Some will actually bleed out and exsanguinate and die from bladder hemorrhage. The people had 10, 20 units of transfusion. And hyperbaric oxygen is the cure for this in the vast majority of cases. Many urologists don't know about it. GPs don't know about it. But now you do, and you can refer them to us, and we will treat them, and most of them will get better. I'm going to end with a few comments on uh, carbon monoxide poisoning. I don't know if we should be treating carbon monoxide poisoning with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. The literature has gone back and forth. Um, there have been a number of what were considered landmark studies in the past few years. Many of those have been questioned now. Um, and all I can say is the literature, there's not sufficient high quality literature to definitively say HBO should be used for carbon monoxide poisoning. But let me make a few comments about what I do know. First of all, Hyperbaric oxygen therapy is not the emergency cure for carbon monoxide poisoning. It is a treatment that we use in order to decrease the chances of delayed sequelae. We are not going to change the acute management of the acute course of carbon monoxide poisoning with HBOT. So we don't need to be called within the first three minutes of the person's arrival in the emergency department. We need to be called once the person has been stabilized, got their gases, you look for co other co-ingestants, you know how bad their acidosis is and all of these things, because we have a 12 to 24 hour window to treat these people. If we get them within 12 hours, we're very, very happy. And it's much better to have the person stabilized, fully assessed, and in our chamber than having them arrive not being fully assessed for the other things that may have happened to them along with their carbon monoxide poisoning. So this is an urgent issue. It's not an emergency issue. And so you have time to take your time and assess the patient properly, treat their Tylenol overdose, whatever else is going on, and then we can see them. Also, it gives them a chance to sober up because these patients, about a, probably half of our patients are intentional overdoses and half of them are exposures by other means. So it's getting to be springtime just to, so I can be up less at night Folks, don't use your gas power washers indoors. Don't do it. Don't use your gas power washers to, to wash out inside of your garage or other enclosed spaces because you're going to get carbon monoxide poisoning. And, and we have a, a flurry of these every spring that people are out with their power washers in their garages, in various places using it, and they get carbon monoxide poisoning. So just don't do it. So what half are accidental, half are intentional. The ones that are intentional almost always have co-ingestants. So they've got alcohol on board, other drugs on board, and you can't take an intoxicated person and put them in a the hyperbaric chamber. When you're asking yourself the question, can this person go in a hyperbaric chamber, ask yourself the question, would I hand this person a knife and lock myself in a closet with them for three hours where I had no way to get the door open for five minutes? Because that's what you're doing. You're taking a person who may or may not be cooperative. You're putting them in a steel chamber for three hours with one nurse. And once that door is closed and they're at pressure, we can't access them for three minutes at the most. They're alone in there. 
And all a person has to do is pick up an IV pole and swing it at a window to decompress the chamber. Or there are a variety of other things you can do in a hyperbaric chamber to cause trouble. So people have to be cooperative. If they aren't cooperative, they can't go in the chamber. So they need to consent. If they're not cooperative, they need to be intubated and sedated and have surgical myringotomies that we do in the, in, the, in the unit. But there's no in-between. A person can't go in the hyperbaric chamber unless they can actively participate in their treatment. So that really takes a lot of carbon monoxide poisoning people out of the equation because they don't want to be there. And if they aren't saying, please, 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 give me hyperbaric oxygen therapy, we can't treat them unless they're intubated. It's kind of one or the other. So the literature on this topic is um, unclear. But I can tell you what we currently do, which is a reasonable course of action until this has been further clarified in literature. And this is what I would do if I was poisoned or my kid was poisoned or my wife was poisoned. Anybody who has a, an exposure and a documented loss of consciousness, I think, should be treated. Anybody who has had a seizure after exposure should be treated. Anybody with persistent neurological findings, mostly cerebellar, should be treated. Any pregnant patient with a level over 5 or 10 should be treated. And the reason is that fetal hemoglobin has a much higher affinity for carbon monoxide than maternal. And it is well documented that maternal, that fetal death and fetal malformations do occur from carbon monoxide poisoning. It's not well documented that we're going to affect the outcome of that disease. But it, there's a reasonable argument for treating pregnant females with HBOT. So in that subset of people, and you notice, and nowhere on this list am I talking about a level. We don't care about levels. If we're on the fence and the level is especially higher, especially that might alter things somewhat, but generally we don't base it on levels. We want to have a level in order to confirm the diagnosis, right? So we want to have this unconscious person lying beside a pressure washer actually has carbon monoxide poisoning and hasn't had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's a good thing for us to know before putting in the chamber for three hours, right? So we want to confirm the diagnosis, but we're not actually making a decision on whether or not to treat based on a level. And the reason is because carbon monoxide levels or carboxylin levels do not correlate with outcome and they do not correlate with exposure. So do the levels, but if we want to know what they are, but we're not going to treat based on a level. We're going to treat based on symptoms primarily. Uh, we like to get people into the chamber within 24 hours. Beyond that, we're not going to be treating them because beyond 24 hours, the benefit falls off. And we are not going to treat people who are post-cardiac arrest with obvious neurological injury because the survival from that is essentially zero. If you are so badly poisoned from carbon monoxide poisoning that you have a cardiac arrest, your brain is toast. So those people we're not going to treat. Uh, there are some logistics because if these people are intubated, they need to come to us, they need to go to the ICU, and they need to go back home again. So there are a few hoops to jump through. So who to refer? Well, I'm just giving this presentation so you'll put some things on your radar screen that might not have otherwise been there and recognize some of the limitations of what we do and some of the logistical challenges that we have. So a case of gas embolism that occurs in the ED, either from a procedure you do or it can happen without your intervention, uh, that's a case to be thinking about, is this a gas embolism? Decompression sickness, take a history about what the gas load was. And if you're uncertain, just give us a call. We're happy to have phone calls to somebody on a pager or a, or a cell phone 24-7. And we are delighted to talk to any emergency physician who has a question about, I just want to run this by you. We love those calls. So call us if you have a question. If you don't know, give us a call. Uh, Your conference is scheduled to end in two minutes. Thank you. Uh, Artery occlusion, chronic osteo, radiation status, and hearing loss. Those are the cases. I'll stop there. Talk about that. Two minutes for questions. Oh, I'll leave that up there for you as well. Questions? 
Thanks for your talk. I guess the, the couple of questions I have are about the ones that seem relatively time sensitive that you mentioned, mentioned like the retinal occlusion and, and the um, central neural hearing loss. For the retinal occlusion, I mean, I think it's pretty rare that we make the definitive diagnosis. I mean, often we get them seen by, I mean, definitely somebody we suspect that we're going to get alto, we usually see them within a few hours, maybe right. just tonight, we may be sending them over for the eye care center. So, you know, then we're talking about another two, three hours later. So I, do you think we should be sort of revising that that process in terms of getting, bypassing ophthalmology, even though we may not be 100% certain of the diagnosis? No, I wouldn't bypass ophthalmology, but I, but I would urge you that if you look in the retina and you say, that doesn't look quite right. I'm not really seeing, I'm seeing veins. I'm not seeing arteries in there it's pale, then that should be a call to ophthalmology and hyperbaric medicine simultaneously. And I guess the other one with the hearing loss, I mean, you know, there are people, you know, there are people who maybe have allergies or, you know, or some other thing, okay, could this be mutation to dysfunction? We're not sure. I mean, obviously, if, if those people went into the uh, chamber with mutation to dysfunction, that wouldn't necessarily be outcome, and so that's one concern, and then, and then the other one would be, we see a lot of people who play hearing loss, and then they have wax in their ear, it's like, okay, well, maybe this is through an action, go home for the next day, get an earwax kit, remove it, and if you still have hearing loss, then you need to represent. I mean, on terms of the timeline, are we okay with that also? Yeah, so with, with hearing loss, we have a two-week window to get them started. Um, you can often make a distinction between whether it's sensor and neural or conductive hearing loss, right? And if it's earwax or station tube dysfunction, it's going to be conductive. If it's sensor and neural, then those are the people that we need to be hearing about. And again, within a couple of days. So they, they, we wouldn't treat in the absence of an audiogram usually. But if you look in there, it's a normal ear and the person says, I just can't hear you. And it's usually that pretty dramatic. And that's the person we should hear about. And that referral can be made the next day or in a couple of days, but don't wait a couple of weeks. Do we lose our link? We still can maybe a minute for other questions. Yep. Any other questions? <laughs> yes. I do it myself. Yeah. If it's um, if it's a Children are different. Just repeat the question. So, oh, okay. The question was for myringotomy. Do you need to arrange a myringotomy? And the answer is no. If it's a child, then they need to go to children's hospital, have an anesthetic, and have a myringotomy, plus or minus a tube. Usually no tube, just a myringotomy. Because children under 8 typically can't equalize. They can't be talked to. Children over 8, 8 to 10, can usually be taught to do that. Most adults can equalize their ears. About 10% cannot. Um, but... We do the myringotomies ourselves in the hyperbaric unit. Um, so I do a myringotomy on every unconscious intubated patient, and I also do it on awake, conscious people who can't equalize if they're in an emergency and must be treated. So we do them ourselves. George. Have you had experience with carbon monoxide from a propane lamp uh, from exposure? Propane lamps is used in uh, ski cabins at yep. altitude. Yep. Propane, any combustion of protein causes carbon monoxide. So if you're in a cabin with propane lamps or a propane stove or a propane fridge or any source of propane, you must have a carbon monoxide <laughs> sensor. People think, oh, it's propane, it's clean. There's no carbon monoxide. That is not true. It does produce carbon monoxide. So if you're in any environment where propane is being burned in a closed environment, they cost 30 bucks Canadian Tire. It's a good investment. 